Can you turn me up a little bit? simple. We will hear the lecture and then entertain some discussion as time permits. I thought it was going to be questions, but our speaker tells me, no, she's got questions for you. It will be discussion. <laughs> but we will finish by 9 o'clock. Begun in 2003, the Confluence Lecture was devised by the Unitarian Universalist Ministers of Canada and continues to be sponsored and managed by that professional association. The lecture has several purposes. First, it is a chance for the minister serving in Canada to offer a significant program piece to the CUC's annual conference and meeting. Second, it is intended as a thought-provoking discourse given in some depth, more than the usual 12 to 20 minutes we get on Sundays. The appointed lecturer each year chooses her or his own topic with no restrictions. It is a chance to speak boldly to all Canadian Unitarians. And finally, it is a chance for the ministers in this land, when we gather each year, to look around our week-long annual retreat that follows this conference and meeting and says, who do we really want to listen to next year? <laughs> and the answer at our gathering this time last year was met with wide acclaim it was the Reverend Mulora Lindgren. <laughs> Mulora grew up in Los Angeles and holds an undergraduate degree in psychology from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Her Master of Divinity degree, degree is from Harvard Divinity School. I think that's in Boston somewhere. <laughs> she served congregations in Newport, Rhode Island, Sacramento, California, and sort of in Washington, D.C., except she was a stay-at-home mom that year while her partner, Shauna, uh, was, uh, was bringing in the paycheck. Melora and her spouse, the Reverend Shauna Lingood, are co-ministers of the Unitarian Church of Victoria and are completing their sixth year there. In addition to sharing a full-time job, they share the mothering of two children, ages 10 and 3. Melora loves show tunes, junk food, Organizing things, yes. office supply stores. <laughs> I added this one taking meticulous notes on her ever present laptop and is terribly fond of Eeyore, the gloomy gray donkey from the Pluto. Would you please welcome this year's Confluence Lecturer, Reverend Melora? Many of you out there are church leaders, lay or clergy, and I'm defining church and leadership very broadly. Raise your hand if you have ever worked on any project or task that supports the aims of Unitarianism and Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I have two things to say to you. One, thank you for your service. Thank you for your time, energy, effort, ideas, and commitment. Thank you for your caring. Two, I worry about you, <laughs> about us. Over my career as a parish minister, there have been numerous occasions upon which when I check in with a lay leader about the challenges they are facing in their church work, they end up in tears. When I ask my colleagues if this happens with their congregants, they nod their heads in assent. 
Not everyone is the crying sort, of course, but what I hear is that many church leaders have at some point been deeply, visibly upset about church. Ministers, too, by the way. I know I have shed my share of tears over congregational frustrations and challenges. I think of these distraught UU leaders, clergy and lay people alike, and I wonder why. This is supposed to be amazing, life giving, energizing work we are all doing together. Maybe this happens with any work about which you care deeply. Your devotion to the work may cause you to take on more than you can handle or pressure yourself with unrealistically high expectations. Furthermore, working toward great ends in community with other flawed human beings can be difficult. There seem to be two common reasons that provoke tears in our UU leaders. One, a sense of overwhelm and exhaustion. Our people work so hard doing the tasks of all that needs to be done, sometimes taking on jobs or feeling stuck in roles out of sheer obligation. We, you, devote countless hours and sleepless nights not just doing the tasks, but working out the problems. It's hard work, and when there's too much of it, we get burnt out. Tears of overwhelm and exhaustion. The other scenario that provokes deep upset in UU leaders is feeling the strain of difficult interpersonal relations. Someone says something critical or disrespectful or downright rude. Hurtful words and hurtful behaviors in person and often on email. Perhaps you too have witnessed less than kind words traveling to their target in a UU community over email. At first, Victoria, our board and several of our committees now have, as one of their covenant points, something to the effect of, if issues become emotionally charged, step away from the computer. <laughs> or put down the tablet or whatever. Overwhelm and unkind behavior. It may have already occurred to you that the two issues can sometimes be connected. That is, overwhelm can lead to cranky behavior. A congregant in Victoria said that when dealing with parishioners who say or do hurtful things, she sometimes finds it helpful to remember principles that she learned as a parent. She says that when little kids misbehave, it's not because they are bad kids. Sometimes, the situation to which they are reacting may not even be the real source of the problem. A skilled parent can discern when the appropriate response to a cranky child is, Oh, sweetheart, I see. You're just tired. You need a nap. I wonder, sometimes, how much congregational crankiness would dissipate if at key moments we ministers and church leaders just took a good long nap. <laughs> I worry about church leaders. I worry about newcomers, too. Even in the friendliest of congregations, there are still newcomers who report that no one talks to them at coffee hour. It's not that our people are being mean. Our people are just busy, rushing hither and yon, getting things done, or catching a rare moment to connect with a friend that they haven't seen in a while. When newcomers do happen to receive a warm welcome at coffee hour, I still hear difficult, tales of difficulty integrating to the larger congregation. They have a hard time figuring out how to get involved, or when they do get involved and suggest a new idea, the new idea is quickly rejected. We tried that before and it didn't work. Or, oh, we don't have the money for that. And there are the quirky personalities to negotiate as well. Some of us have rough edges, sometimes made more rough by the aforementioned strain on church leaders. Of course, it's not always like this. Sometimes we are delightful and our newcomers find us so. But it is, I'm afraid, sometimes like this. So many of our mission statements reference living with love or compassion. I wonder, 
To what extent do we do it? How might we consistently embody the love and compassion we profess to believe? In the introductory blurb for this lecture, I mentioned that in the Presbyterian church in which I grew up, though I disagreed with the theology they taught, I loved the way we worked together toward the larger good in the world. In our children's choir, we learned a song that I still remember. <clears throat> I'm not a singer, but I want to give you the flavor of it. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Some of you know it. It makes me wonder, what would it take for us to behave in such a way that people come to know we are Unitarian Universalists by our love? How might we consistently embody the compassion we profess to believe? We have such great potential. First of all, I've seen us do it. I've seen us embody that compassion. Maybe you have too. I was at a minister's gathering recently at which three ministers from three different generations spoke of their first experience of Unitarian Universalism as lay people and how their respective congregations wrapped each of them in love. A youth, a young adult, and a single parent with small children. Their stories, which occurred decades apart, shared common threads. How people of all ages were kind and encouraging, how grateful they were to the people who stepped forward as mentors, taking seriously their questions, struggles, and insights. How they felt supported and accepted as they were, unsure and still figuring things out. They were patiently held in love as each of them made their way into a path that was right for them. I believe in our potential to embody compassion because I've seen us do it. I also think our theology gives us a solid grounding to support and explore the practice of embodying compassion. I know some of you have an adverse reaction to the word theology. As a humanist, I am using theology in its broadest sense, not just about God, but about our religious worldview. If you prefer, you can sub in philosophy or the term suggested at the AGM, geology. <laughs> I will use theology for now. You may recall that about a decade ago, our movement was asking itself, is there a unity in our theological diversity? Some wondered if our lack of a clear answer to this question weakened us as a movement, leaving us theologically shallow as well as anemic in our vision and mission. I was intrigued by these questions from the very beginning, and over the years I've come to believe that there is indeed unity in our theological diversity. Nearly every UU I talk to cites as their favorite principle our first and or our seventh. In their adult curriculum articulating our UU faith, Reverends Barbara and Jaco Tenhove use a model that shows our first and seventh principles as the two pillars that hold up the rest. Don't worry about reading the print. I just want to show you how they envision the first and seventh principles as pillars supporting the arch. Reverend Barbara Tenhove states that one and seven are statements of what we affirm about life, whereas the others are more about how we agree to be together. I have come to think of principle one and seven as theological statements. They are statements about what we believe is sacred, what has worth, people, and the interdependent web of life. We don't believe that people are inherently sinful. We don't believe the earth is value neutral, a resource for us to plunder. We believe that the whole web is worthy of reverence and respect. Moreover, the statement that we are interdependent is an ontological claim about the status of our being, which has further theological implications with regard to our religious worldview. So I think of one and seven as theological statements, 
The other principles, two through six, are statements about our values. They are statements about how we agree to be with one another. Here's another way to show one and seven upholding the rest. This is the model by Riddle Debut that was featured in the CUC Vision Task Force's report. The first and seventh principles are shown as concentric, concentric circles containing the others. It makes sense, right? If you believe that each person is valuable and worthy of care, and if you believe that we are held in an interdependent web of life that is also valuable and worthy of care, then everything else follows. Supporting one another in spiritual growth, the use of the democratic process, peace, liberty, justice, equity, and so on. The way I see it, our first and seventh principles give us theological, solid theological grounding for the practice of embodying compassion. A little caveat here, when I say compassion, I don't mean fluffy, feel-good, hallmark, hard, nice. I mean a deeper, action-oriented caring, grounded in an understanding of suffering and a commitment to end suffering and injustice by standing on the side of love. This is the logical conclusion of our first and seventh principles. If everyone is valuable and we are all interconnected, then we are all called to care for all with compassion. It's why we're always repeating that quotation from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Our own new CUC vision makes this point too. Our interdependence calls us to love and justice. That's what I'm talking about when I say embodied compassion. So I think there is unity in our theological diversity. I think over the past decade, that unity has become a solid grounding for theological depth and for the practice of a set of common values, not the least of which is the practice of embodied compassion. The genius of our principles as a basis for a religion is that it gives us core theological claims about what has worth, as well as support for individuals in exploring a wide range of personal theological variations. Theist, agnostic, atheist, pantheist, and so on. Ours is a religion very well suited to today's pluralistic culture. There was a time in UU circles when we used to lift up as our most important principle the one about freedom of belief. And we would then paradoxically use it as an excuse to wield our own particular beliefs as weapons. I'm a Unitarian, I can believe what I want. We would proclaim our own individual beliefs loudly and defiantly with a subtext, sometimes implied, sometimes stated, that anyone who thinks differently is stupid or unenlightened. As a result, we ended up with many people feeling marginalized at best, maligned at worst. Pagans, Christians, humanists. It seems that nearly every theological group, except maybe the UU Buddhists, has at some point felt disrespected in their UU communities. I think we have matured since then. I'm sure it still happens here and there, but I think we are getting better. First Church in Victoria called myself and my wife Shauna as co-ministers, in part because we personify this theological pluralism. I'm an agnostic, sometimes atheist, with leanings towards earth-centered humanist spirituality. And Reverend Shauna is a theist. She uses words like prayer and God. And our congregation has, with minimal squirming, rolled with it. <laughs> and even learned from it. I myself find the theological diversity in our movement exciting and enriching, and I think more and more you use feel the same. Instead of crossing our arms and arguing against someone else's theology, we lean in. How interesting. Tell me more. How do your beliefs affect your day-to-day living? How do your beliefs support you in your justice work? This is the part of our new CUC vision that says we aspire to be theologically alive, open, and ever-evolving. As an agnostic spiritual humanist, I love living with a theist. 
Sometimes I even borrow her God, as in, what a gorgeous day. Shauna, will you tell your God thank you for me? <laughs> or, this is so hard. Shauna, will you pl- pray to your God for me? I'm a little bit like an old-school Catholic in that way, relying on the intervention of clergy to connect with God. <laughs> It has been a while since postmodernism taught us that there is not one capital T truth, but instead there are a variety of truths. And I think as a whole, we are more open to possibilities, playing with metaphors, and learning from one another's experiences. It can be similar to the way we learn from and are enriched by art or literature. We don't have to believe in something literally. We don't have to believe it's literally true to be inspired by it or comforted by it, or to learn from it a truth about human nature. That was just a little digression to say that I think we've self-corrected, and we are back on the path that allows us to mine the richness offered by our unique combination of theological breadth and depth. Back to our original question, if we do indeed have a core theology based on principle one and seven, and if that theology gives us grounding for a core practice of compassion, How do we practice that practice? How do we live compassion with every word and action so that people might know we are you used by our love? How do we embody the compassion we profess to believe? It might help to think of models, public figures or people in your own life that embody compassion. The Dalai Lama, perhaps, a particular aunt who was a steady source of unconditional love, What about your fellow Unitarians? I invite you to take a moment to mentally scan the people in your UU community. Who are the warmest, most welcoming people? Who in your congregation does the best job of living with compassion? They might be extroverts, they might be introverts. In your mental scan, look for the good listeners, supportive, understanding, non-defensive, assuming good intentions, The people who would never send a nasty email, abruptly shut down a newcomer's idea, or rudely dismiss a person's spiritual practice. Who in your UU community embodies compassion? Next time you see that person, you might want to voice your appreciation. Or do it this weekend. Send them an email or a text or a call. The person that comes to mind when I do this mental scan is a Unitarian I know whom we will call Jim. Jim radiates calm and kindness. You can tell that he genuinely cares about the well-being of whatever person is before him. He listens like he is taking each of your words into his heart. His whole focus is on you. He's not looking over your shoulder, planning who he'll talk to next. He's not thinking about his to-do list, and he's not thinking about what he's going to say when you're done talking. And there's something about his quiet calm that makes you feel like you can be your authentic self with him. You don't have to fake cheerfulness if you're not feeling cheerful. He accepts you as you are. My mother had a very scary brush with cancer a few years back. Jim now periodically asks me, how's your mother doing? That's the kind of caring person he is. So that's who I thought of when I considered you use I know who live with compassion. I noticed something else when I did that mental scan of our UU community. It's not as simple as the warm, loving people on one side and the mean, cranky people on the other side. (laughs) There may be a few who stand out as examples of the extremes, but I wonder if maybe most of us are in between. I know I am. When I set my sights on the inspiring models of compassion, whether it's Jim or the Dalai Lama, I see the spiritual work I have to do to live into my own best self. You see, when I'm very busy or tired, when I've had too many difficult conversations, when I feel like I can't take on one more thing, I tend to assume this spiritual posture. Head down, shoulders hunched, arms crossed, heart closed. 
It is a rigid, self-protective, self-focused posture. It is an emotional stance I can fall into when I'm feeling hurt, fearful, worn out, or just plain cranky. My spiritual challenge is to stretch to this posture, arms wide open, to be the warm, loving me that I can be when I am centered, rested, and relaxed, the flexible me, open-minded, open-hearted, reaching out, able to hold others in empathy and compassion. It's the spiritual stance that goes with our core theology and common intention to hold one another and the world in love. How do we do that? How do we go from this to this? Again, how do we embody the compassion we profess to believe? I wonder if we can find inspiration in the part of our CUC vision about aspiring to be spiritually grounded. Specifically, I wonder how many of us engage in heart-opening spiritual practices. I admit that I don't, which kills me. <laughs> I mean, what's up with that, right? I'm a minister. You would think it would be part of my job to engage in regular spiritual practice. But other things always seem to squeeze it out. Committee work, worship prep, email, and so on. I do have it on my list of sabbatical projects. <laughs> Establish and maintain regular spiritual practice. In the meantime, I am still searching for models. I should perhaps clarify what I mean by spiritual practice. I see a spiritual practice as anything that evokes in you a felt sense, a visceral sense, of connection to something beyond yourself. That something beyond yourself could be God or human community or the web of life. A humanist spiritual practice could be hiking to the top of a hill to watch the sunrise as the light touches the clouds, the earth, your face. You feel your body both expand and kind of melt. You feel held in the larger interconnected web of life, and your heart opens. You'll note that I'm, I specified I'm searching for spiritual practices that open your heart. I've done some heady meditations that get me nice and calm, but what I'm talking about are the ones that invoke in me a sense of open-hearted love for the world. As with my definition of compassion, I'm not talking about a butterflies and flowers kind of love. I'm talking about that larger love that can hold suffering too, your own and that of others. Prayer can do that, whether we're addressing a personal God or an amorphous force of nature like the spirit of life and love. Spirit of life and love. Hold me in my worry about what is happening in our world. Help me to let go of the tightness, to find strength to move beyond fear and into love-centered action. Buddhist loving-kindness meditations are another effective heart-opening spiritual practice. Many of you are familiar with these. You wish wellness for self, then others, in ever-widening circles. You bring each person or group into your mind's eye, hold them in your heart, and then recite a series of wishes. I invite you to do an abbreviated version right now. Get comfortable in your seats. Breathe in. Breathe out. Bring your attention to your center. Take a moment to check in with yourself. How is it with your heart these days? As you continue to breathe in and out, I invite you to repeat aloud these phrases of meditation. May I be well. May I be well. May I be safe. May I be safe. May I be content. May I live with ease. Now bring into your mind's eye someone else. You choose. 
an individual person or a group, known or unknown, perhaps a loved one about whom you are concerned, perhaps the refugees sponsored by our congregations. Bring them into the circle of your loving attention. Then repeat these phrases. May you be well. May you be safe. May you be content. May you live with ease. So may it be. Practices like this help me move from this to this. They get me closer to living the compassion I profess to believe. What works for you? Remember the Unitarian I mentioned earlier, who I'm calling Jim. When I asked whether he has a spiritual practice of any sort, he told me he does three things regularly, nearly every day. First, he wakes up early and spends some time communing with the still, small voice within. He begins with an invitation. Spirit of life and love, sacred presence known by many names, I trust that you surround me and are with me. And if I listen in the silence for your small voice, you will guide me in all I do and say this day. May it be so. And then he listens. It is a time to set his intentions for the day, letting love take the lead. The next thing he does is join his partner in listening to a meditation CD that guides them in deep breathing and relaxation. And the third thing he does every day is to go for a walk in the woods. Many of you are familiar with the virtues of this spiritual practice. Each seasonal shift is both invigorating because it's new and reassuring because it's happened before and will happen again. The timelessness of the natural world invites us to see a wider perspective. We are a tiny part of a larger whole. Jim says it inspires him to live his own brief life to the fullest with the most love possible. In her closing words earlier this evening, Reverend Deborah Thorne lifted up the fact that we are creating a new community this weekend. This is such a great opportunity to share with one another and learn from one another. I have several questions I'm going to encourage you to ask one another over the course of this weekend. The first is this. Do you regularly engage in any heart-opening spiritual practice? That is, when do you feel held in something larger than yourself, God, community, web of life, such that it opens you, empowers you to live in the compassionate way that you long to live? And here's my second question. In what ways does your UU community support these heart-opening spiritual practices? on an institutional or organizational level. There's worship and the meetings that begin with readings and check-ins. Beyond that, I wonder how many of our congregations have found ways to support an ever deeper, more sustained spiritual practice and development. In other traditions, they call this spiritual formation, studying your faith, wrestling with it, practicing its disciplines, internalizing your faith to the point where it changes you, to the point that you live your faith in every interaction, large and small. Think of Bible study groups, an incredibly effective method for spiritual formation. The groups serve several functions. They help participants apply the tenets of their faith to their daily struggles. They place participants in a circle of care, and that circle of care prays for one another. They engage in heart-opening spiritual practice together every week. Over the years, we Unitarian Universalists have tried various versions of institutionally supported spiritual formation. You'll recall the popularity of small group ministry, known in many settings as chalice circles. Remember when I was telling you about Jim's three heart-opening spiritual practices? There's actually a fourth. He is a member of a covenanted small group that includes fellowship, deep check-in, and a time to share spiritual experiences and insights. 
Various more intensive spiritual deepening programs have been developed as well, most notably UU Wellspring, designed by Reverend Jennifer Crow. There are two spirituality curricula on our UUA's online tapestry of faith. Some among us have explored various Parker, Palm Parker Palmer models, such as the Circle of Trust, which is available for this, through the Center for Courage and Renewal. And in recent years, many of our congregations have started doing a type of theme-based ministry that uses Reverend Scott Taylor's Soul Matters model, which he presented at a CUC conference a couple years ago. Raise your hand if you are in a congregation that is doing some form of theme-based ministry. Yeah, so a lot of you know about this. You can ask the people with their hands up to tell you more later. I'll just do a quick overview. That's not what I wanted. There we go. Each month, worship focuses on a particular theme. The deeper work happens in small group programs. Small group participants receive a packet of materials at the beginning of the month to inspire their exploration of the theme. Specifically, participants choose one question to grapple with over the course of the month and one spiritual exercise to do and then reflect upon. In a month on resilience, you might choose a question that asks you to consider, for example, what actions do you take to support the Earth's resilience? And how does doing so support or diminish your own sense of resilience? One of the spiritual exercises Scott Taylor gives as an example is from a month on grace. Watch the movie Amelie, which fe features a woman who does anonymous random acts of kindness, and then go be grace in the world, noting how you choose your acts of kindness how they make you feel, and any difficulties you may encounter. At the end of the month, participants gather in their small groups to listen to one another, share their experiences and ponderings. As an institutional way to support spiritual formation, this program has all the key elements. Like our earlier forms of small group ministry, the Soul Matters program gives participants a circle of personal support and care, as well as material to help us integrate our faith into our daily living. Many of the spiritual exercises suggested in Soul Matters have the potential to be heart-opening spiritual practices. Holding one another in love as we listen is also a heart-opening spiritual practice. Moreover, this program is designed to support sustained growing and grappling. Unlike some other small group models, you don't just think about the topic off the top of your head on the day you meet with, with your group. You work with it, journal on it, talk about it, grow with it over the course of the whole month. Many congregations integrate the theme and thus expand the growth into their children and youth programs, their social justice work, all aspects of congregational life. So there it is, right? I was looking for a way our communities can support heart-opening spiritual practices that enable us to live the compassion we profess to believe, so people will just by observing us know we are you used by our love. And this is it, right? Problem solved? Well, <laughs> Soul Matters and many of the spiritual formation programs I mentioned earlier, small group ministry, Wellspring, and so on, have indeed had a profound effect on many individual UUs, and on many UU communities. But it seems that in many cases, we're not quite harnessing the full potential of these programs. I'm puzzled by this. I've been wrestling with it all year, and I hope to get some direction from the collective wisdom of this new community that we've just convened here. After you've asked one another about the kinds of spiritual formation programs your UU community offers, I encourage you to ask, and please feel free to share with me, where they work well for individuals and for your larger community, why are they working well? And where they are not working as well as they could, why is that? So far, I've noticed that getting at the richness offered by these programs requires a certain level of commitment. You've got to work the program to have the program work for you. The people who make the commitment are the ones most transformed by the process. What puzzles me is our resistance to that commitment. I see it year after year as we've tried out various models. We'll sign up for something like this because we long to go deeper, 
to refocus our lives on what really matters, to make more space in our lives for centering practices, and then we don't manage to make the meetings or don't manage to do the spiritual homework we said that we were so excited to engage. What is that about? I'm not blaming. I do the same thing. I struggle with this myself. Is it just human nature? Same reason that the gyms make so much money in January on the memberships of good intentions? Is there something in our UU communities that undermines our attempts to seek depth and meaning in a sustained and committed way? Is there some sort of beyond congregations way of doing this that would be more effective? I think of the young adult style Vespers service, services that are working so well at All Souls in DC, or the Facebook group that Liz James in Saskatoon has been piloting. Is our difficulty committing to the rigor of an in-person spiritual formation process just a result of living in a larger culture that is just too busy? But aren't we supposed to be the antidote to that? Aren't our you community supposed to be the places where we slow down, focus on what really matters, reset our intentions on living as the centered, loving people we long to be? Furthermore, aren't our communities supposed to be so warm and loving that people just flock to us because it feels so inspiring to be among us? We might need a multi-pronged approach. Recall the two reasons that provoke those tears in UU leaders, overwhelm and hurtful words or behavior. Along with the development of heart-opening spiritual for animation programs, we might need to also look for institutional ways to reduce overwhelm and promote kindness. I won't say too much about either one of these, but I want to say enough to get your conversation started. In addition to asking one another about heart-opening spiritual practices and spiritual formation programs, I encourage you to discuss with one another in what ways does your UU community support self-care and guard against overwhelm? How might we shift our congregational cultures to support a soul-sustaining pace of living? You know the principles. Encourage people to follow their passions, rotate roles regularly, take breaks when you need to, say no when you need to, be willing to let go of the projects and programs that no longer have much energy around them. Pursue the aspects of our various ministries that you find exciting and life-giving. How do we institutionalize these ways of being? One concept worth mentioning is the simple church model. I hear that Reverend Sean Newton and the leaders at First Toronto have been studying and considering ways to implement this model, and that the Calgary congregation, inspired by their sabbatical minister, Reverend Carly Gaylor, and with the blessing of their senior minister, Reverend Deborah Falk, have bravely, bravely tried out several simple church methods this spring, including experimenting with paperless worship services. Raise your hand if you have learned about the simple church model and or in a congregation that has tried out simple church methods. Simple church, anyone? Okay, so look for those people and ask them about it. Not as many. This and other related methods may help those leaders whose tears are prompted by overwhelm. What about the leaders whose tears are prompted by hurtful words or behavior? Of course, as we mentioned earlier, since overwhelm can cause crakiness, whatever we do in our systems to promote self-care and reduce congregational overwhelm may help us all be a bit kinder with one another. What else can we do? In what ways does your UU community promote a culture of kindness and understanding? Perhaps your community has a covenant of good relations or better yet, an effective way to live that covenant. Perhaps your community uses NVC or compassionate communication techniques. Maybe you've developed a culture of regularly expressing appreciation and gratitude. One of the most effective ways to promote compassion in a community is to build into that community opportunities to hear one another's stories, to slow down and take the time to learn from one another, what is it like to be you? Many of you do this through those aforementioned small groups and spiritual formation programs. This approach is also key to the intercultural competency model that many of us are learning and using in our work with refugees and in our work toward truth, reconcil 
reconciliation and healing between indigenous and non-indigenous people. When we have a better understanding of what it is like to be someone else, seeing through their particular lenses of their culture and their experiences, we are better able to practice that platinum rule to treat others the way they would like to be treated. In our communities, in our relationships, the more we learn about one another's stories, the hard stuff as well as the good stuff, the more likely we are to feel empathy and kindness toward one another. When I asked my Unitarian friend Jim how he manages to maintain that attitude of gentle compassion with every person he meets, even those of us who are being cranky and difficult, he said he reminds himself of how little he knows of the other person's life and burdens. Through his spirituality group and other conversations, he's gotten glimpses into the kinds of suffering that each human endures. So when he is with a particular person, he thinks of the struggles he himself has been through. He figures that they have been through equal or worse, and his heart instinctively goes out to them. I think I would certainly know he is you, you by his love. So where are we? I said at the outset that I was worried about us, worried about burnout, worried about cranky behavior. I asserted that we have potential to live the compassion we profess to believe, that we even have a core theology that serves as a solid grounding for such a practice. I suggested a three-pronged approach and that we mine the collective wisdom of this new community to learn techniques that support each approach. I suggested that we ask each other, namely, in what ways can your UU community support heart-opening spiritual practices and sustained spiritual formation? In what ways does your UU community support self-care and guard against overwhelm? And in what ways does your UU community promote a culture of kindness and understanding? I realize that many of us will have the impulse to assiduously list, learn, study, and implement all of the techniques we hear about. <laughs> Wellspring, Soul Matters, Simple Church, Intercultural Competency, and all the others you will doubtless hear about this weekend. If these ideas put a fire in your belly and get you excited about living your faith with focus and an arms wide open compassion, then great. If, on the other hand, it feels like you're just adding more things to your already too long to-do list, you may wish to consider, for now, putting the list aside and instead focus on finding or renewing your own heart-opening spiritual practice. Walk in the woods. Practice daily loving-kindness meditation. Take a nap. My dear, dedicated, hard-working, sometimes weary UU leaders, be gentle with yourselves. Do the things that help you relax into the open-hearted self that you enjoy being. If we all do this, maybe it will come to pass that they will know we are you used by our love. We'll close with words and then a song. The words are the ones by Erica Hewitt that were featured in this year's CUC Sharing Our Faith packet. I invite you as willing and able to stay. You can't really stand in those benches, can you? No. So as willing as and able, uh, join hands with those near you. Or move so that you can touch your shoulder or something. Okay, breathe in, breathe out. The hand in yours belongs to a person whose heart is sometimes tender, whose skin is sometimes thin, whose eyes sometimes fill with tears whose laughter is a beautiful sound. The hand that you hold belongs to a person who is seeking wholeness and knows that you are doing the same. As you leave this sanctuary, may your hearts remain open, may your voices stay strong, 
and may your hands remain outstretched. If you are up for it, let's go ahead and lift our hands in that arms wide open stance. You can let go. There you go. And from that open hearted place, let's sing together, filled with loving kindness. Sylvia will lead us. Thank you. Elliot will play the music.